So Jay, when I turn on the television or jump on social media, you know, we always hear about the curve. Uh, is this thing flattening or, or, or is it the same? Is it getting worse? Talk to us a little bit about what's happening over the last two weeks. Okay, so I definitely think that um, the curve is flattening. But um, the unit is divided into great, okay patients, right? But we still have to monitor them. And then ICU patients that are really sick. So last week I had four deaths within my assignment. Remember, I'm assigned two patients every time I go to work. I may not end up with those same two patients, but um, it rotates. So since last week, I've lost four. Now this week, I've lost one. So you're but, saying you get two patients. Right. When you clock in. Yes. So and last week, you lost four, just your patients. Just my patients, yes. So I am more of the acute side, but what I'm saying is there's 14 beds in ICU. Those are all full right now. On the other side of this unit, there's another 14. Those are tele patients. Those are those patients that you're talking about. They're not, a, a, not on a ventilator. They're on a high flow or they're just on nasal cannula. Those are those 30s and 40 year olds that are talking just like me and you and we're just monitoring their oxygen levels. We're monitoring the virus in their blood. Those are those patients that we are taking plasma, which is part of your blood to test to help my patients who are in ICU, who has a tube in their mouth and they're on a breathing machine. So mind you, this week it's a lot better in ICU because the patients I have have been stable, which means they're breathing fine on the ventilator. Their lungs are looking good. Now my other patient on the other side, which I don't do telly, the walking, talking patients, those are the ones that are going home. Now, Brandon, some of those patients aren't getting better, so they're coming to the ICU. So it's like maybe two or three will get discharged, that's it, and then five will come to ICU. What's that experience like for a patient, from a patient's perspective, if I walk into the ICU, what are you guys doing? What are you guys saying to me? Um, talk to me about that. Okay. Um, so I had the same experience last week where I had one of the cruise ship members. Um, that was my patient. He actually works on the cruise ship and he is alert, followed commands, just like me and you having this conversation. He was not doing good. His oxygen level wasn't there. Um, he has history of, let's say, just high blood pressure, nothing crazy, no autoimmune disorders, nothing. So um, I would walk in, mind you, I look like, you know, fully PPE. Of course, that's going to scare you. Your anxiety levels are going to go up. So I try to establish a relationship with the patient. I have a picture that I wear on the outside. This is really what I look like. Don't mind the mask, the full bunny suit. You know, to them, they yeah. feel like they're on, like, they're an alien on earth. That's exactly the feeling that they get. They're anxious because they're in a different setting. There's gowns everywhere. There's masks everywhere. There's strangers touching them. So the biggest thing is establishing, you know, that connection with them. And then another thing is the anxiety level. You already can't breathe. So once your anxiety goes up, you're, you're unable to, you know, comprehend what I'm saying. You're unable to take enough oxygen into your lungs. So I told him, you know, this is the point that you're at. You've got to control your anxiety. If not, the next step is intubation. And the thing is, you have to be honest, you know, and as brutal as it sounds, you know, you, you have to explain to them that we do have to put you to sleep, especially being on a, in, you know, on the ventilator and being intubated. And it's very uncomfortable. That's why we put our patients to sleep. So we, we're hearing all these stories about, you know, there's only so much you guys can do. And, um, you know, you see the images coming out of New York where they're uh, putting um, people, bodies uh -huh. in 18 wheelers, yeah. um, mass graves. Um, yeah. You said that you lost four people, you know, you know, it, it must be one of the hardest things in the world to do is like to almost feel like 
you know, there's not much I can do right now. I gave it my all, but there's not much I can do. Um, you know, rolling patients on their stomach and, you know, literally just looking at their heart rate and just drop and then it's boom, coded. So I have two friends right now in New York. Um, one I used to work with down here and a big issue that happened last week, it's all over the news. Um, you know, he posted on his social media that we have to cut the oxygen levels because they did not have enough oxygen supply. These patients rely on oxygen. There is oh, not wow. a yes or no, or maybe we can cut the oxygen. No. So he was part of that whole issue where I think it was 20 people died just from the lack of oxygen that the hospital didn't have to supply for enough patients. So that it's more than just ventilators and yeah. masks. We're There's talking about, we're oxygen. talking about oxygen. Oxygen, right. Yeah. A lack of it. And the thing is you can't, how, how do in America, how, how, how don't we, why, why don't we have oxygen? I know. Like, I, how is that a challenge for us right now? How are we lacking in that? I don't know, but I can say that, like I said, all those patients require the amount of oxygen. So it, it's not the regular, like breathe in the air, you're fine. No, it's a percentage of oxygen. And if you're on a ventilator, you can use up to 100% concentrated oxygen, or you can use up to 40%. It's like, again, it depends on the patient's stability, but to not have a lack of, of like to not have oxygen, that's a big no-no. And that's what's, I mean, I think the demand in New York is so much higher than it is down here in Florida. And I definitely think, like I said, you know, the temperature, it's colder still in New York um, and the lack of resources. So that's a big, you know, it's a big no-no. So you're down here in South Florida. Uh, so we're surrounded by beaches. Uh, obviously we made a lot of headlines uh, due to the spring breakers, uh, just being spring breakers, right? And our state not shutting down our beaches and doing the right things fast enough. Uh, Jacksonville opened up their beaches yesterday. Our governor opened up the beaches yesterday. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about um, your idea. thoughts on that. Um, I think it's a bad idea just because, so we're still stuck between, is this droplet, which is like the flu, if you're within six feet, you could still be contaminated. Now, that's why they're saying six feet or more distance, right? So if somebody sneezed on you, Brandon, you want to stay within that six feet. Mind you, I'm dressed up in airborne precautions. Airborne is you can be within or, you know, if you're at six feet, you're still able to still contract this virus. So the CDC is still, they're saying, yes, you can wear the cloth mask, but then here I am donning a PPE for airborne. I think it's a big risk um, that the governor's taking. I think missing out on a beach for a few more months until this subsides is completely worth it versus, hey, going to the beach, yeah, we'll regulate social distancing, but you're still exposing other people to this virus. Yeah. And, you know, 20% of healthcare workers are the ones that are contracting this virus. You know, they said yesterday, 20%. And that's, to me, is big. Like, I'm asymptomatic, but I've only been taking care of positive COVID patients. So I wouldn't want to expose, I'm self-quarantining. I don't, I have not been around my family. I don't want to expose them to anything that I could potentially develop into. You know, it's just like Von Miller. He's healthy, healthy athlete, you know, you know Von, and he does have history of asthma. That's the only setback I would think in his medical, um, you know, background that could potentially worsen the COVID virus. But it's like you said, you know, being healthy, you know, working out, exercising. I think that um, exercising your lungs, you know, cardio is big, big, big right now. That's why I've just been running every single day because, you know, opening up your lungs, this is acting like acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is the mucus gets so hard and it, it, it literally deteriorates your lungs. So you're unable to expand your lungs. 
Um, but yes, going back to the beach, I think it's, you know, definitely a terrible idea. We, we, we went on our friend's boat and I'm sitting out there. I'm like, there's nine, there's nine cruise ships out there. Mm-hmm. They were just waiting. And is this the, are these the cruise ships that we're seeing when we turn on the TV globally talking about hundreds of people stuck on these cruise ships? And I, and I text you or I you know you, 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 you messaged me and you're like, they need to stay right there right now because our hospitals mm-hmm. are yeah. overwhelmed and it's just, we're at capacity. We're beyond capacity. Right. So last week I lost four patients. Um, The one that really touched me was a daughter and her father. He was my patient. And, um, you know, she wanted to see him. And obviously the policies are there's no visitors in and there's no visitors out. So it's a closed system. So the hospital now provides iPads. Great. You know, it's the opportunity for the best way for the family member to get to see the patient. Um, so I decided, you know what, I'm going to do it. I'm going to FaceTime this daughter with her father. And um, to paint the picture, he has a tube in his mouth. He is not awake because I have to sedate him with a medication called propofol. You sedate them so they don't one, take the tube out of their mouth and then, you know, um, become more distressed and could possibly die from that. Or, and the second one is to rest their lungs. So they're not breathing over, over breathing, which is like hyperventilating. So you're not getting enough oxygen in your body. So he's not awake. Um, They say hearing is the last to go. So they do hear you um, if they are able to comprehend, which she said, you know, my father was able to talk to me and comprehend what I was saying. And, you know, telling her that his heart rate isn't being controlled by the drugs that I'm constantly monitoring, um, which he was on two, two drugs to control his heart rate. His His heart rate would go up to 150, 160, which is not livable if it stays there for more than I want to say an hour to two, your heart is just going to eventually give out. Um, He was turning purple from all the pressers I had him on. That's the drugs that we control your blood pressure with. He was turning purple because those drugs are, they squeeze literally every single blood out of your veins to pump it back to your heart. So your heart will have enough blood to pump. So he was turning purple. I knew he wasn't going to make it. So this whole part of acceptance that we do now with these iPads is for the family to say their goodbyes and to literally live with the fact that you won't ever see your family member again. This is your last chance. And so she was, she still didn't want to make him DNR, which is you know, do not resuscitate, which now in the hospitals, which you've seen on the news, we are no longer doing chest compressions. So a lot of the physicians will watch from the camera. Every room has a camera and we will watch their heart rate. You know, I was in there at the time and his heart rate went from 110s in another hour, it went to 50. And that's when, you know, I alert the team. I think it's gonna happen and, you know, he is going to pass. And, you know, the daughter was on the iPad because The thing is, you want to see your loved ones and what we're doing the best possible. And the reasons why we're avoiding compressions, which is you're pressing on someone's chest, is so that the rest of the team don't get exposed to the virus. Because if you're compressing, your um, blood could be involved. Um, You're exposing those particles into the air. And so what we do is we turn up the um, drugs, they're called pressers again, and we turn them up as m- the most we can and we hope for the best and we pray that his heart will, you know, eventually surpass it and he didn't.